That's the Underground Lovers losing it from way back in 1995. They actually won Triple J's Album of the Year in 1994. Okay, next we are going to take a trip on a bicycle. You're listening to Evenings with Indira Naidu on ABC Radio Sydney, Canberra and New South Wales. Now, did you know that today is Bicycle Day? And no, it's not some global day to glorify riding around on two wheels. It's actually a day to celebrate the discovery of LSD. So, what do bikes have to do with LSD and why is there a day to celebrate it? Well, we thought we'd ask a man who knows. Dr Stephen Bright is a senior lecturer in addiction at Edith Cowan University and is here to talk to us about Bicycle Day. Stephen, hello to you. Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> Stephen, now this, when we saw this story, uh, I, I'd never heard of Bicycle Day before. And this whole story about how LSD is connected to it is quite, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary story. It almost needs a film in itself. So tell us what Bicycle Day actually does, Mark, if it's not bicycles. Sure. So the short answer is it marks the... Uh, accidental discovery of LSD, but um, I guess, you know, as you say, there needs to be a bit of a, a movie made about this because <laughs> there's a bit more to it. So Albert Hoffman was a Swiss chemist um, working with Sandoz in, in, you know, in the 30s and 40s, and he, at, in, the, in the late 30s, he was looking for a new medication to treat migraine, and so he was working with, um, with, with ergot fungus, which grows on rye, and has actually been associated with um, people experiencing um, psychedelic-like effects, but also dying because the the the, the ergot um, is also quite poisonous. And so, um, in in the late thirties, he synthesised LSD for the first time. It didn't seem to have any promise using the animal models that they were using back then. And um, for whatever reason, on the sixteenth of April, nineteen forty-three, um, he had a, he sort of had an an, in, an intuition, a hunch that um, there was something that had been missed, and so he synthesised it again, and somehow accidentally. Um, accidentally exposed himself to the LSD, and he did, must have had a fairly small amount. He didn't feel, um, you know, he didn't feel right, um, and went went home that day. But then, uh, on the nineteenth of April today, eighty years ago, um, he intentionally ingested LSD based on the fact that there seemed to be something there that he'd been exposed to. So he took a quarter of a milligram or 250 micrograms, which is in those days was seen, seemed to be a, a non-active dose of any drug. You know, drugs were, yeah. were measured in the milligrams, not the micrograms. But, of course, LSD is a very potent drug. That was quite a, a heavy dose. And so immediately after the, the drug's effects started setting on, he um, realised that the laboratory wasn't the best place to be, and so he hopped on his bike and took himself home. Right, and that's the connection to the bicycle. Correct. <laughs> wow. So do we have much information? What did he say that that trip was like for him, that experience of the first LSD trip? Well, he describes the start of it as um, very positive. You know, he saw uh, beautiful colours and, and saw the inherent beauty in nature. Um, but, you know, the, the bike ride home was fascinating, interesting, visually stimulating. When he got home, though, he started to have, I guess, what we would call now a bit of a bad trip. Um, his, he, one of his neighbours came and checked on him, and he, was, he, he reported that all of their faces were distorting, and um, it was quite frightening. But based on that experience, he went on to further self-experiment, and essentially that led Sandos, the, the drug company, to, to send this out to psychiatrists around the world to try to determine what it might be useful for. And this is what's so fascinating about the LSD story, Stephen, is that at this stage it was legal, it was being used by medical practitioners, they were starting to see some positive responses to it in their treatment. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, initially that it was it was used to try. Uh, it was used with with uh, schizophrenic patients and um, with, with not much success. Um, at, at that time, we didn't have the word psychedelic, so it was called a psychomimetic because it, it mimicked, or well, they thought it mimicked psychosis. Mm. And so, psychiatrists would take it to to get empathy for their patients with schizophrenia. But ultimately, it, um, you know, that it was being used in LSD assisted psychotherapy for a range of conditions, including um, alcohol use disorder or, or alcoholism, uh, end, of, end of life anxiety and, uh, and other conditions as well. I'm speaking to Dr Stephen Bright about Bicycle Day, which isn't about bicycles, but actually about uh, LSD and Albert Hoffman, who on this day really experienced the, the, the first trip associated with LSD. Uh, Stephen's a senior lecturer in an addiction at Edith Cowan University. So, Stephen, this is where the story gets so interesting. I read uh, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, about the history of psychedelics and what happened politically. So there are all these benefits the medical profession are experiencing, and then the politicians got involved. So what happened then to the story of LSD, Stephen? Well, well, essentially, despite promising data, um, and when I say promising, that, that there was quite a lot ga gathered. There was over 1,000 papers published documenting some 10,000 patients who had received this treatment. Um, but, you know, you had people like Timothy Leary who were... were um, Beshrewed by both uh, psilocybin and the active ingredient in magic mushrooms and LSD as well, and essentially, you know, the, his methodology became quite lax, and he ended up becoming he ended up being fired from Harvard University, uh, moved to upstate New York, where he told the world to tune in, uh, to turn on, tune in, and drop out. And so that was it, it. Wasn't a great time for there to sort of be this cultural revolution because the U.S. was at war with Vietnam, and so they wanted they wanted to do something to to prevent what they saw as a mass um, uprising occurring in the U.S. Yeah, and so then what happened to LSD? So um, LSD, psilocybin, and, and, and a range of other drugs that were, were legal at that time were banned. And essentially, uh, they, they were first banned in the US and then uh, through countries ratifying uh, a convention with the United Nations, it was essentially outlawed worldwide. So all of the research shut down very quickly. Um, and ultimately, uh, there was there was a... Uh, it was a war that involved, you know, propaganda, and a lot of there's a lot of misinformation about LSD that came about as a consequence of the propaganda that the Nixon government was releasing to try to justify, you know, what they had done. Mm. And this is the, the the fascinating part of the story in LSD. So all these decades later, since that era, there is renewed interest in LSD, particularly with the the rise in so many mental health conditions that we're going through at the moment, and. LSD is being understood now a, a lot more clearer to have all these benefits that a lot of these other drugs that have been used uh, don't have. So, so what are they, Stephen? Well, certainly there's, there's you, you're right, there's been this psychedelic renaissance um, in which researchers have, have reinvestigated the, the potential therapeutic properties of LSD and other drugs. So the research is primarily focused on psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And the mm. reason being, one, it's, well, well, at the start, one of the reasons for using psilocybin was, um, you know, most people didn't know what it was. LSD had, you know, a, quite, a, quite a strong brand attached to it. And, but in addition to that, therapeutically, psilocybin is probably a better candidate because it's shorter acting. LSD lasts about 12 hours, whereas a psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy session lasts about six. And this psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy has been demonstrated to um, re reduce depression in people who are experiencing treatment-resistant depression has, has actually been um, you know, recognised as a medicine by the Australian government in February this year. We're the first country in the world to recognise psilocybin as a medicine. Mm. I know that that was incredible, wasn't it? Um, did you ever think that we'd be the first country to do that? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it came to us. It came as a huge dis- surprise, not only to myself but also to my colleagues, because the TGA is typically quite a conservative regulator. Um, I would have thought that the FDA would have approved it first, but clearly, it's that that's an that's a good demonstration of the amount of evidence that that's been accumulating now. Yeah, about psilocybin. When it comes to LSD, getting back to that, uh, Stephen, I understand that it's it's not addictive. Is is that correct? A hundred percent correct. Because uh, LSD and other classic psychedelics have this almost this foolproof nature to them. Uh, it's called the scientific term is cataphylaxis. Essentially, if you take LSD one day, if you take it the next day to get the same effect, you'd have to double, triple, or even quadruple the amount that you're taking, and the next day, so on and so forth. Um, so a tolerance to it builds much more rapidly than to any of the other drugs that, you know, I guess recreational drugs, things like alcohol, tobacco, um, you know, methamphetamine, so that the tolerance to, to LSD builds very, very quickly, meaning that you really can't use it consecutively. Mm. And so when it comes to using uh, LSD, what is actually happening in, what does it actually do to our, our brain, our mind, Stephen, that can be beneficial if, if we're suffering some of these mental health issues? Well, we, we, we certainly know a lot more about the way in which classical psychedelics affect the brain through this psychedelic renaissance. So we used to think that drugs like LSD um, turned on parts of the occipital lobe and that could explain the visual perceptions that that people experience. Um, But in the last 10 10 or so years, um, it's been shown that what's actually happening is there's a part in the prefrontal um, cortex that's being turned off and that part of the prefrontal cortex is a bit like the conductor in the brain. And so if you you have the orchestra playing without a conductor, you get a cacophony of noise um, that that may not necessarily make sense, but that that sort of better explains the psychedelic experience. Mm. But the, the reality is that LSD is still illegal. Stephen? Yeah, I'm sorry, just cut out. Oh, cut out. I was just saying, uh, the reality is that LSD is still illegal, even though they're, they're, you know we know that there has these health benefits for us. Yeah, and I actually don't see the law changing with regard to LSD in Australia anytime soon because there hasn't been the level of research, you know, recently at least conducted with the drug. Right. But I, I, I would, I would, I would argue that it's it's probably less harmful, um, you know, in a regulated environment to to alcohol. I mean, as we just mentioned, there's there's low potential for addiction. Um, you know, people can become psychologically dependent on something, but that's a bit different. And it, to, toxic, you know. Toxicity-wise, it's um, it, it's quite safe. Nobody has ever died from an LSD overdose. However, um, in this modern society that we live in, there are actually hundreds of chemicals that are being sold on the black market as LSD, and so it's actually the prohibition of it and the emergence of these new dangerous chemicals that, that makes LSD or illegal LSD use so dangerous. Mm. Dr. Stephen Bright is with me, senior lecturer in addiction. You specialise in in addiction, Stephen, and, and you understand the current culture and the way our society looks at all these variety of drugs and how we find some acceptable and some unacceptable, and it's more cultural than actually how dangerous the, the drugs are. Do you see a time when LSD will be something that we we're all you know micro you know dosing on in in a very sort of casual social way um you know the way we do with some more harmful drugs like like cigarettes or alcohol well actually you you bring up a really interesting point because i think in the context of microdosing and because there is so much hype around it and and research is currently underway to explore whether you know it, it does actually do something and it's not just the placebo effect but should there be good evidence that microdosing lsd um, has potential health benefits, then perhaps we might actually see it regulated as medicine because you know we would be okay. Society would be okay with that because it has its its function then as a, as a medicine. Yeah, and then it would be a, an extraordinary full circle story, the LSD yes. story, wouldn't it? Absolutely, and and we're sort of seeing that at the moment with with drugs like MDMA and psilocybin, where they're they're coming full circle now. Yeah, amazing, Stephen. And you're right in the middle of it. You, it's, it must be such an exciting t- time to be working in, in addiction. 
Well, particularly with regard to psychedelics, it, it, is a, it is a really exciting time. I've been working on getting uh, research happening in Australia on, on the therapeutic use of psychedelics since 2010. And um, we, we recruited our first participant for a trial of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy last year. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of research happen fairly recently in Australia. And uh, myself and, my, and a few colleagues from Psychedelic Research and Science and Medicine, which is a not-for-profit organisation that was established in 2010 to get this research happening, um, you know, I guess are really to thank for that. Yeah. I suppose it's a question I shouldn't really ask you, but have you ever been tempted to or have you ever taken LSD just from a research point of view? I, I have a standard. I have a standard answer, yeah. and that is, um, you know, I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. True. I've actually looked. I've done research on how people's perceptions change, whether you admit to or, or not admitting to it, and and you really are damned if you do, and damned That's if you true. don't. But it is so fascinating because I I just can't imagine the feeling i guess when when you read about how what people explain to you there are parts of it that you you do want to you know the good bits obviously that you want to experience um with... well look look there, there there is um quite a strong argument in the field that to to work as a psychedelic assisted psychotherapist people need to undergo a psychedelic experience and you know, there's another world first that in at Monash University in Melbourne, uh, one of the clinical trials there actually involved all the therapists undergoing their own psychedelic experience before providing the psychedelic therapy. Right. Okay. And and what did they report back from that? Well, similar to similar to what you're saying, it, it is difficult to understand something if you haven't, you know, really experienced it. And so they saw the value in not only um, not only having that, but also being able to answer participants' questions about the experience and feeling more confident that they were able to answer those questions, you know, to the best of their ability. Yeah, interesting. Stephen, thank you so much uh, for talking to us about Bicycle Day and uh, the different sorts of trips you can take on bicycles. It's been lovely chatting. Thanks, thanks very much for ha having me and happy 80th Bicycle Day. Yeah, thank you. Dr Stephen Bright, who's Senior Lecturer in Addiction, from uh, Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. It's interesting, isn't it, where, where this is going to go? But the main thing is there are real people in need uh, that can be helped uh, from uh, a lot of the investigations that are going on around psychedelics and uh, psilocybin and, and such. All right, you're with India and I do. Oh.